I'm, I'm very pleased to introduce our next uh, speaker, um, Jed Ng, who uh, built the, the largest API marketplace uh, and, uh, and is an active uh, investor in API and, and tech initiatives. And he's going to tell us about, uh, about the entire business of APIs. Um, Jed, over to you. Morning, John. Thanks for having me. Uh, let me put open my screen. Can you see? Yep, we can see. Very good. I'll jump right into it. Uh, so good morning, everyone. Um, and, and thanks for attending and, and taking time to listen. Uh, I'll be speaking today about the business of APIs, and, and this will be largely driven from my experience in the last two or three years building the world's largest API marketplace. So if we look at enterprises, you know, we see uh, some pretty interesting use cases or ways that uh, enterprises have used APIs to drive their business. <clears throat> so for a company like Salesforce, APIs were a way to turn a product into an ecosystem by letting third parties build complementary services on top. Uh, in AWS's case, I see them as using APIs to move users from up the stack from lower level infrastructure up to other services to, to create uh, stickiness. Another example that I, I really like is a company like Best Buy, which is a consumer electronics retailer in the US. They actually use APIs as a digital enabler to turn what is traditionally an offline brick and mortar business to power things like credit card reward programs. Now, um, I'll share a little bit about my background and, and a story just to set the stage. Uh, about three years ago, I took a flight over to Silicon Valley and found myself uh, in a WeWork pitching the CEO of a seed stage startup and uh, about five other employees. So this feels like a lifetime away back when WeWork was still a, a, a hot uh, tech stock or tech company to get involved in, unfortunately. And what came out of that discussion was a common vision uh, to build a single platform for developers to consume and manage public APIs for their applications. Uh, the, and out of that discussion, uh, I did a deal with a seed stage company called Rapid API. They went on to raise funding from Andreessen Horowitz and Microsoft Ventures, uh, and we grew to become the world's largest API marketplace together. And today we work at uh, a pretty large scale. Uh, our footprint is 10,000 APIs and serving over a million developers around the world. Now, if I had to share uh, our mission a little bit, uh, it, it, it goes a little bit like this. For API providers on the left, we want them to be successful by connecting them to our community of developers. And for developers, it was about solving the friction through the API journey in their application lifecycle from discovery to connecting to services, to paying for them and managing them on a single platform. And, and the reason I share this with all of you is that I believe we have a unique position in the ecosystem in that the way we create and capture value effectively by making the market or facilitating transactions is generally good for what's all of us out here uh, attending this conference. And there's three fundamental points that I believe make us all successful together. Number one, we need to help uh, all API providers be successful, even if you're in the long tail, a fair chance to be successful. Second, for developers today, using public APIs for services uh, is fraught with friction and it needs to get a whole lot better if APIs are truly going to have a, a place in modern development practices like DevOps and CICD. And lastly, it's about making transactions, right? Because transactions are the what drives economic lifeblood that, that creates sustainable value so all of us uh, can be successful together. Now, depending on who you ask out there, whether they're a developer, a marketer, a technologist, uh, or a business person, they'll have a different version or different definition of what an API means. So I'm going to, to offer you my definition and you can decide whether it's relevant or not. For me, the way I see APIs today is a technology for service distribution, that's it. I also happen to believe that APIs are 
intrinsically valuable, in fact, more valuable than software and SaaS. And here are the reasons why. The first reason is that APIs serve all software segments. So for developers, whether you're building, uh, no matter the digital interface that you're building, whether it's SaaS, it's a web app or native mobile, the same API works. And if you're an API provider, it means that you have one single product to build and maintain. Next, APIs are quick and easy to integrate as long as they're, they're well designed and documented. And users are not only accustomed, but even prefer to work on a self-service integration, which means that for API providers, you benefit from shorter and more efficient sales cycles. The third is that API services, the business models tend to be pay as you go. Now for developers, this makes APIs, uh, there's a strong argument for the cost effectiveness of using public APIs in your applications, if you can find one that suits your use case. Right, there's absolutely no getting around the cost effective effectiveness of this. There are certainly other reasons why you might consider against using a public API, but cost shouldn't be one of them. Now, if you're an API provider, it means that your revenue grows alongside your users' traffic as their applications scale, which makes APIs as services uh, platforms in and of themselves. And the last argument is around stickiness or churn. For developers, there's a, a pretty high switching cost associated with swapping out when and one API for another. It's not like changing to another CRM or emailing system. For API providers, I think that makes uh, revenues around here more sticky since the churn should be lower. And I went about looking for some data to make this argument, right? And the easy comparison to make is to look at public a public companies looking at the SaaS segment versus APIs. And I picked these four companies here. On the SaaS side, uh, we'll look at Zoom and Atlassian, arguably two of the hottest tech stocks out there today. And on the API side, uh, Adyen and Twilio. If we use a single metric on valuation, which is the revenue multiple, what we found is that Zoom and Atlassian value revenues or investors value these SaaS revenues at 20 to 53 X uh, multiple, which is pretty healthy. But if you look on the API side, we see a range of 70 to over even a hundred X. So I don't know that this is definitive by any means, but it's quite a strong directional indicator that API revenues definitely are more valuable than traditional SaaS, given the, the differences between uh, in this small comparison. The next thing I want to talk about is that um, just by, by providing the right context, that APIs are actually a relatively new business model. So this graph that you're looking in the background uh, shows Google Trends search traffic for two terms, REST API in blue and SOAP API in red or pink. What the data shows us is that it was about just over 10 years ago at the end of 2008 that REST started catching up with SOAP in, in popularity. And I've always found it interesting that the reasons that this happened um, are basically point to the rising power of developers in the tech ecosystem. Developers effectively chose REST over SOAP because it was more lightweight and responsive and that JSON output was more human readable and friendly than XML. And I think there's a strong message here for us, all of us to pay attention to, to developers and users and what their needs are. And if we take this same data set and extrapolate it to today, you see that it's not even a competition. REST simply dominates. And roughly around the same time, uh, we saw the rise of what I call native API companies. These are companies that use APIs uh, solely as their technology for service distribution and therefore monetization, which is why, where I get my definition from. These companies that you see on this slide, Stripe, Adyen, Sangrid, and Twilio, it, it's hard to imagine that actually 14 years ago, none of them existed, none of this existed at all. It was pretty big news uh, about five years ago when Twilio hit a billion dollars in valuation. In the last five years, they've actually grown 37x 
in valuation since then, which is pretty crazy. And despite all of this, I believe that we're only at the starting phase of APIs as a business model. We might see the players in established categories like payment processing, communications, and email, but we'll see a whole host, whole host of new applications and use cases emerging. And actually, since this conference is targeted at Singapore, I really have to give special mention to the WaveCell team. Uh, just when the, the competitive scene you know, look, look to be stacked with Twilio, Nexmo, and Telesign, uh, WaveCell exited to 8 by 8 communications in Q4 of last year. Looking forward, I'm really bullish about uh, segments like B2B data and lead enrichment. Uh, EKYC is another really interesting use case with uh, companies using computer vision for KYC purposes and, and search uh, for applications is another uh, interesting space. Now, because of all of this success, I firmly believe that the growth of APIs, especially public APIs, will continue. Uh, by some estimates today, that there are over 30,000 public APIs available. Uh, and if you look on programmable web, their directory shows about 40% year over year growth. And this momentum looks to be continuing. And I think this presents a, a huge amount of opportunity and success. But the downside of this is that if you are a public API company uh, and you don't get your go to market nailed correctly, you get risk being trapped in, in what I call a digital ocean. And, and this simply means that APIs are purely digital products. They exist on the internet and are theoretically frictionless. But the reality is that is that if users don't know where to find you or they can't find you, you simply will not be found and therefore you can't be successful. And so it's a, a really strong point about thinking about how you go about marketing your API uh, or API program in order to be successful. This pie chart that you're looking at is from Apigee State of the API Reports. Uh, and it's, it's a survey over the enterprise customer base. The story it tells is that the top 25% of APIs garner about 90% of call traffic. And so if you extrapolate that across the general API landscape, uh, it, it signals towards the uh, challenges for smaller API providers if you're relatively unknown or well, not well capitalized. I want to shift gears a little bit and talk about developer experience, or, or DX as I call it. I think for all of us here, uh, it behooves us to think about this as an ongoing topic. In my opinion, developer experience needs to get a whole lot better. If you look at the discovery problem alone today, across these 30,000 APIs, it is extremely difficult, if not impossible, for developers to find and access the right API services for their use case. This infograph that you're looking at is uh, something called API landscape. It's built and maintained by the API days team. And it gives us a, a small glimpse into the diversity of API services that exist today. But discovery is only the first step. The next part of it is that developers, even if you could shortlist a, a set of service providers, you need to go through multiple dev developer portals uh, of all different stripes. And assuming that even if all of these API providers had beautiful, simple, easy to access portals with well-documented, uh, it was well-documented and, and well-maintained, this task is necessarily still pretty tedious, time-consuming and manual today. And, and I think if somebody can crack the code of making this programmatic, it would be just like incredibly valuable. But access and processing of these services is only the first step of it. Then uh, our developer users need to get access to them. And often they contend with approval-based access. It's not immediately available. They might have uh, unclear pricing structures. So even if they were interested in using something, they might not be able to access it or know if they could afford it. They might struggle to connect to these services because stool, uh, tooling is, is static or, or pretty poor or not available on a self-subscription -subs basis. 
And, and finally, throughout your application lifecycle, for every public API that you use, you need to manage one account per API provider, maintain a separate key per API service, make a separate payment to each provider every single month and go to multiple dashboards. And, and this is frankly a lot of friction for our users today. And I think that in response to this, we're going to see some interesting business and technical innovations emerge to solve some of this complexity. One particular trend that I find quite interesting is this idea of APIs as aggregators. So this is the idea that an API could be used to unify multiple service providers underneath, effectively building plumbing to different service providers, all performing the same function, or multiple APIs performing the same function. Three examples out there uh, are Nihilus, which provides an API to unify mailboxes and calendars. There is Zeus that uses a single API to integrate with multiple payment processing providers. And Plaid, which provides an API to look up uh, consumer data and to fac facilitate transactions across multiple consumer bank accounts. Incidentally, I first spoke about this in late Q4. And uh, in Q1, Plaid was scooped up by Visa for about $5 billion valuation. So clearly a very uh, hot and valuable space. I'm going to shift gears a little bit now and talk about enterprises and how we see the uh, adoption or evolution process. Generally, enterprises follow this three-step process. Right? They often start with using internal APIs. This is the middleware view where APIs are used to connect data, databases to systems as a way of driving operational efficiency. They then become consumers of public APIs. And here it's about using uh, public APIs to leverage external capabilities or specialization that you might not have in-house or could not afford to, or it's simply not cost-effective to do. And eventually, some of them even become API publishers and they external, externalize their APIs in order to monetize or build an ecosystem around their brand. And our broad scan of market data tells us that for every enterprise that is using internal APIs, about two thirds are consuming public APIs and one third uh, are publishing APIs. We also ask these companies what their pain points or concerns around API adoption were, and this is what they said. The top pain points for them had to do with API reliability, security, documentation quality, followed by API discovery and internal capabilities. What's interesting to me is that if we map out these pain points against the three uh, phases, we find that the vast majority of uh, enterprises are concerned with uh, consuming public APIs, which suggests that most enterprises are in that middle tier of the segment and uh, might struggle to break out to that third phase. So staying with this theme, right? if you were an enterprise or, and you wanted to structure an API program, what would that look like? You know, I propose this framework, which I call APIs of product thinking. And I've deliberately used the term product because I think a product mentality necessitates technical and business stakeholders coming together. Aside from all the mission critical things that you need to do around designing your API, developing and iterating it and maintaining the service, you need to be thinking about how you should price these services, having analytics so you get the right level of insight, uh, providing channels and access to these APIs, and also thinking about your marketing. And the way I really think about a fully fledged API program is that it's in a series of layers. The bottom layer, the functional layer, are all the things that I already spoken about, the things that you actually need to do. In the middle layer is the operational layer, the people that you need, the team who's going to execute this. And importantly, at the top, an executive layer of leadership who's going to support and empower you and drive you toward, uh, towards being a strategic asset. Now, I want to dive specifically into the area of API marketing as the last thing that I speak about. What you're looking at here is 
uh, a whole set of activities that my team has carried out over the months and years, uh, both offline and digital. And it's a lot. Having a proper API marketing program uh, spanning online, offline, and DevRel, it's a tremendous amount of work. And I want to share a couple of lessons. If you're just starting out, one of your challenges is how do I find my initial users? Especially if you're not well capitalized, you don't have a big budget, and, and you need to watch your spend. Uh, I encourage you to think about go to where your developers, or where your users might be hanging out at, and go engage them on that level. So one example where we did this is using Quora. Why Quora suited uh, us was that uh, on Quora, you see a pretty large base of interest around the topic of application programming interface. Uh, in Quora, users on the platform ask questions regarding this niche, which means that you're not proposing things. People are actually looking for answers. And thirdly, because of, of the format of Quora, it actually takes relatively effort a relatively low effort to engage each one of these users by providing useful information. So the screens up there are actual answers that we provided through a persona account. And using this methodology, which basically takes us about maybe 20 minutes a week, uh, we managed to grow quite well um, a passive recurring user base uh, using Quora that converts into registered users at about a 7% rate for us. Another piece of advice I would give you is to think about uh, an experimental approach and linking up different activities uh, in order to build scale and efficiency. So this year is my hackathon playbook. So what we've done with hackathons was, yes, our objectives are to get in front of developer users and get to get them hands-on with our platform. Out of using hackathons, we also started a Ninja uh, community program. It was a matter of time before we linked these two things up where we actually were able to connect um, to empower our community champions to uh, serve as mentors at, at hackathons. I remember one specific event uh, weekend in September of last year where I had four hackathons going on in four different countries at the same weekend and three of them were actually staffed by my community champions. And the great part about all of this is that after each hackathon, we build new champions uh, to recruit, and, and the cycle goes on from there. So finally, I'll leave you with this, my marketing stack. You can think of this as a way of structuring your, uh, your API marketing program across objectives, um, the, the tooling that you need, and, and how you measure these things. It's not meant to be a playbook, more like a framework for you to uh, guide your efforts and to think about what you want to do and link different things up. So getting back to the original topic of my discussion, which was the business of APIs. Just to catalyze this a little bit, I'm going to share uh, an idea that I'm personally very passionate about and I'm working on. And that is the idea of an early stage investment thesis around API companies. We talked about the things that are on this slide already, that number one, API businesses are intrinsically valuable because of the characteristics of self-service adoption, stickiness and churns, and API products as platforms. I also see in the industry multiple investment vectors or entry points uh, in APIs as products, APIs as aggregators, and next-gen tooling. And I think the last piece out of this that makes the idea really interesting is the idea of, of providing unfair advantage. In the, the right team or a dedicated uh, domain focus on APIs would solve technical founders struggle to capitalize at an early stage, especially if you're pitching to, to angels or, um, or, or generalist VCs. The right team with good operating experience could develop a common scaling playbook across all of these companies. And this right team could also help these companies be successful through uh, um, a deep domain network. So I'll leave this with this. I hope this was interesting. I'll also share my personal contact information in case any of you want to chat and get in touch. Thank you for listening.